Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're continuing our series of discussions with Stephen Cohen, and his biography is down below the video player, and you really should watch the first few segments anyway, and you'll get where we are. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. So, in 58, you seem a little oblivious to the Soviet Union as the existential threat. Like in your conversation there, your, your story, you're not going to a place that's you know, out to dominate the world. I mean, you don't seem to have the Cold War psyche. Is that true? I, I don't know. I, maybe I was too busy chasing girls. Uh, maybe down in Kentucky people were too busy hating on blacks for me to focus on the communist threat. Though, threat, though, I should say that at the high school in this town, Owensboro, Kentucky, ROTC was obligatory, high school. It was also obligatory when I got to Indiana University. So remember these times, ROTC wasn't an option, it was obligatory. If you stayed in college after two years and did four years, you got commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army. It was a way of the Army getting young, sol you know, young officers and other people avoiding the worst of the draft. But I don't know, it didn't seem to be, Russia didn't seem to be this looming threat down there. I mean, um, it wasn't until later in life I encountered it, first at the university and then in New York. I mean, maybe, I know that McCarthyism, because my wife, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, uh, the editor and the publisher of The Nation, uh, soon to be the uh, editorial director and publisher of The Nation, she did a lot of research on the McCarthy era as a student and later when she was working as an independent journalist. And it took her to places like West Virginia to meet victims of, people who had been victims of McCarthy. So I know that McCarthyism spread outside the urban centers and outside Washington to towns where it took down school teachers and people like that. But I think ultimately it was an urban phenomenon, a political capital phenomenon. Certainly the, the domestic consequences of the purges was more urban. But the idea that there's an existential threat to America, there needs to be this great big military industrial complex to defend America from the Russia threat, Soviet threat, all of that, you go, you have a trip, you come back, you start studying. You seem to have a relatively open mind about it back then. Uh, See, we, we who grew up in the, uh, in, in, in the Jim Crow South, in little towns, would say to you, well, y'all, we're worried about, but we all weren't. However, it should be said that I believe it's the case that in high school, the assigned textbook in civics or something was J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover on communism, which essentially warned us that communists were everywhere. But I tell you again, I never met a communist until, I mean, I mean an American communist until I got to New York. It just wasn't part of the culture there. I mean, it is, see, it's, it's interesting. I mean, again, you, everything is generational. But for my generational, the difference between the political culture in the Northeastern political capitals, Washington, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, places like that, and what agitated people there, Reds and communist threats and all this, I think if my memory serves, now I'm tapping into the memory of a boy, uh, but, but what agitated us down south were different things. But I'm talking about now when you're 19 and 20 and, and you know, you're but far now, more politically aware. No, but now I'm moving into what I would call my intellectual biography. This is different. Now I'm studying, I'm reading. Uh, you went to the Soviet Union to come back. Yeah. Did you think the Soviet Union was a threat to the United States? I thought nuclear weapons were a threat to the United States. From the day I began to understand that each side had delivery systems that could deliver nuclear warheads. When I realized that that was our new reality, and by the way, it's even more the reality today, though we don't pay a mind anymore. From that moment on, I became an advocate of detente. Uh, that is cooperation with the Soviet Union and then post-Soviet Russia to reduce the conflict of what appears to be, by the way, let me add something. I just figured it out this the other day. If we take 100 years of relations with Russia, Soviet Union, and then post-Soviet Russia, 
American-Russian relations since, let's say, the Russian Civil War, 1918, 1919. That's 100 years, right? One century. 75 of them have been Cold War. Think about it. Do the math, right? 1917, 1933, the United States didn't even recognize the existence of the Soviet government. Cold War won. Then comes the 40-year Cold War, which ends in 1988. Then comes the new Cold War. That's a theme of my new book, War with Russia, which begins, I would say, with Clinton's decision to expand NATO and his bombing of Serbia at the end of the 1990s. So you add it up, out of 100 years, it's 75 years of Cold War with Russia. That's something to think about, because everybody thinks this began yesterday. You know, this is a long history. What makes it different and more consequential is the invention of nuclear weapons. Because the first Cold War, 1917 to 1933, 15 years of Cold War, wasn't dangerous to anybody. It was intensely ideological. There was a red, square, uh, a red uh, scare. But we weren't on the same continent, and we didn't have weapons that could reach the other country. Everything changes with the advent of deliverable nuclear weapons, and even more so today. Uh, people aren't even aware of the new weapons the Russians have developed in response to our so-called missile defense. It doesn't get any play here. We're too busy worrying about whether Trump paid off a prostitute or something. But I mean, things have changed existentially in regard to nuclear weapons today. We pay no mind. But for my generation, who thought about Russia, two questions emerged insofar as we were political. Now, a lot of my colleagues weren't political. They studied 17th, 18th, 19th century Russia, pre-revolutionary Russia. I was interested in the history. I wrote about the history of Soviet Russia and the political history. But the question became, for those of us who were political, twofold. Could this Cold War hostility, this hating on each other, actually lead to the use of nuclear weapons? And what could we do as in people who knew something about Russia? Not as pro-Soviet or pro-Russian, but as people who actually had knowledge as opposed to attitude. What could we do about it? And the second question was, could the Soviet Union change? Those became the two kind of great debates within the field, so to speak, for my generation. How could we avoid the worst? And along the way, could the Soviet Union change? Because there was the orthodox majority view in Russian studies at that time that the Soviet system couldn't change. I, it says on my new book, uh, War with Russia, question mark, on the front, they take a quote from some magazine that I'm the most controversial Russian expert in America. Uh, but I've been controversial ever since I entered the field because of these themes, because people said in the 70s and 80s, the 60s even, but 70s and 80s when I entered the field, the Soviet system couldn't change. And a number of my books were about the possibility and prospects of change. I won that debate in 1985 when Gorbachev came to power. I got some things wrong, but on the basic question of whether that Soviet communist system could produce a reformer who would change the system, I was right. Now, flash forward, right, to 1988-89, when President Reagan and Gorbachev, leader of the Soviet Union, and a changing, reforming Soviet Union, announce the Cold War is over. They said it. I'm not making this stuff up. You can look it up. And Bush said it, the first Bush. I was working for CBS then, and I went to Malta for the uh, Gorbachev-Bush uh, uh, summit, the one, the seasick summit, where they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't get to each other's boats, and they were getting seasick, and they couldn't meet. But when they did meet, they announced the Cold War was over. So the great issues, you might say, of my generation, young people entering the field, could the Soviet Union change, had been answered, and could we avoid nuclear war seems to have been answered in 89 when Bush and Gorbachev said the Cold War. I didn't believe it for one minute. I didn't believe it, that the Cold War was over. Uh, and I said so in writing and on CBS News, because I was working for CBS and reporting, that, you know, two guys say it's over, but the Cold War was a lot more than two leaders. When I interviewed Daniel Ellsberg, uh, he argued 
that at the top levels of American intelligence, certainly at the top levels of the Pentagon, and at some of the top levels of American political stratum, they knew that the Soviet Union was not a threat. They knew the Soviet Union had no plans to invade Western Europe. They knew that in the beginnings in 60-61 when the Air Force was claiming that there was a missile gap and there was, uh, you know, they said the, claim, the Air Force claimed the Soviet Union had a thousand ICBMs and it turned out they had four. Um, the, uh, that this was, to, he, his conclusion is, is that the Cold War was primarily for commercial interest. It was a propaganda campaign to justify money-making for weapons manufacturers. It's too, I don't mean to be uh, dismissive of Dan Ellsberg, who's a very great man and a good thinker, uh, but it's too simplistic, it's too one-dimensional. The one thing I've learned as a historian, that if you want to discuss a major event in history, a really big event that changes history, uh, for example, seg it interests me, segregation in the South, right? or the onset of the Cold War, or Vietnam, which interested me because I didn't want to get drafted and go to Vietnam. Uh, one factor will never explain it. Well, I Not don't think one. he reduces it to well, one factor. It's very important. But it's it's very a important. dominant factor. I, mean, I, I know very well the argument that the Cold War was very profitable for weapons makers and for certain intelligence services and the rest. But it had a long, we, I've already pointed out to you, we already had, see Dan's talking about, we already had a couple decades of Cold War. It was embedded in institutions and ways of thinking beyond just the people who controlled the munitions industry. I have no doubt it was a major factor. I mean, look, ask me why they expanded NATO, the great folly of our time. Boy, has that been profitable. Every little country or big country that joins NATO has to buy American standardized weapons. It's been a boondoggle for the, and you can go back when we had the debate about should we expand NATO eastward or not, the debate that occurred in the 90s. And lordy, the Pentagon was putting out promotional uh, uh, advertisements for the great advantages of expanding NATO. So I don't dismiss the economic and base, I would say, motives behind this, but things were a lot more complex. Yeah, I don't think he and I don't, nor do I. I, mean, if I. Let me interrupt you one thing here. I mean, Dan would know better because he had a, had a professional career among intelligence people. He knew them better. But I've known a few of these people over the years, and I've sent students, when I not sent students, but I've supported students who wanted to go to work for the CIA, and I encouraged them, and I, let, I wrote letters of recommendation uh, for them, which is to say that, that People who work, let's just take the CIA, because the FBI is a completely different kind of organization. But let's take the CIA. And my experience is, is that over the years, from the middle to the top, I don't know about the lower level, and we're not talking about the, the wet boys, the assassins, but we're talking about real intelligence officers, right? As Putin was, for example, intelligence officers. They analyze intelligence using their intelligence, sometimes with open sources, sometimes with classified sources. My experience uh, over the years was is that there were some really remarkably intelligent, decent, uh, thoughtful people in the CIA working on the Russian side of things, as, as well as, as a bunch of thuggish types which is to say that you get up there a mix and there's a struggle in the intelligence agencies about what information finally goes to the decision makers and here's the problem. You can have the brightest CIA analyst on Russia saying the most enlightened thing, but does it get to the Oval Office? And we have plenty of instances where it's been thwarted. Yeah, well you can see that in Ellsberg's a lot of the intelligence Ellsberg was seeing wasn't getting to the White House. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think he would discount in any way the fundamental threat of some form of socialism to the capitalist world, both ideologically, politically. But I'm talking this, the, the spe sort of the specificity of the post-World War II Cold War, that the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. They knew it wasn't true. It was a great movie, by the way. The Russians are coming, yeah, the know. Russians are coming. And somebody should, it's a very funny movie uh, and great political satire. And it should be re-released today because they're telling us the Ru no, the Russians are already here. The Russians are already here. This will be the sequel, right? Well, what's the premise of Russiagate? The Russians put Trump in the White House, so the Russians are already here.
It's the same premise of the Cold War. The Russians want global hegemony. I'm joking. I'm saying it's no it. longer the Russians are coming. Yeah. The Russians are already here. Well, the, the parent, but, if you, the yeah, parent, you know, I guess I had a kind of, uh, I, I don't know why. I mean, I knew people who were passionate Cold Warriors, fanatics. So you weren't. So look, um, I take this seriously. I have my political views. I have my, you know, shall we say, predispositions, even biases, prejudices. But if you're going to work as a scholar, if you're going to do it right, you really have to try to be objective as possible. Now, that's an abused, cliched word. But what does it ultimately mean? It means seeing both sides, all sides of a story, and going nowhere near an interpretation or a conclusion without verifiable facts. The American media today has completely lost that capacity. I mean, Trump has driven them completely crazy. They've abandoned all their standards. But in my day, that was something that, 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 that sense that you have to see the whole story and you have to have verifiable facts was something that was shared by scholars, by journalists, and by medical doctors. One hopes. Because I don't want a doctor operating on me based on some cockamamie story he picked up in Washington, right? This was a kind of, it was more than, a, it was a given that if you were going to do scholarship or you were going to do journalism, I mean, at a high level and devote your life to it, you did this. And what you learned then is, is that stories, narratives, history is so multifaceted that you've got to weigh all stories before you think you can get the story right. One of the themes of my work, especially on Russia, has been alternatives in history. I have a book called Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives. Uh, and in fact, in the introduction, I even mentioned growing up in the, in the South, in the Jim Crow South, and how alternatives and, I mean, I want, I mean, to show you how puzzling this can be to a kid, I think the first time I wondered about alternatives was when I figured out that both the presidents of the American Civil War were from Kentucky, Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. So I'm kind of puzzling, scratching my head. You know, this is like high school stuff. So how could it be that one guy from Kentucky became the president on this side of the Civil War and one guy on the other. So what does that mean, Paul? That means that it, in Kentucky, there were crossroads in Kentucky's history. Kentucky left the Civil War more Jim Crow than it entered the Civil War. But Lincoln had hoped Kentucky wouldn't join the Confederacy. So evidently, there was in this history of Kentucky a crossroad, just as there had been in Soviet history. And that always interested me. Not counterfactual. People write counterfactual. You know, what if Hitler had died in 1930 or something? No, that's not interesting. Given the actual facts and alternatives at a given moment, a turning point, 1929 in the Soviet Union, when Stalin imposes collectivization on the peasantry and changes everything. The revolution of 1917 was basically over. Think about it. In 1917, the main essence of the Russian Revolution is the peasants took the land. That's what drove the revolution of 1917. The peasants took the land. 85%, 82% of the population took the land on which they had been served for themselves. 1929, what did Stalin do? He took the land away from the peasants. He imposed collectivization, state farms. Uh, Gorbachev, who grew up on a, on, a, on a collective farm in Stavropol, uh, said that there they called it the second serfdom. So what am I saying to you is that these turning points, these reversals, these decisive moments in history, because Stalin's decision in 1929 changed everything for Russia, for the Soviet Union, there was an alternative. Okay. So factually, you research the alternative. You see the people, you write the story, but then becomes the why. That's the hard point. Why was this road taken when the alternative was also? And that's was, your book on Bukharin. Yeah, but it was present in terms of social forces, ideas, and leaders. They could have done it another way. Bukharin represented the other way. They didn't. How do you explain that? I think you can take that 
way of asking questions and apply it to any turning point in history. Vietnam, Russiagate, I think, today, because it's going to affect America for decades, years for sure, maybe decades to come. Uh, so we kind of drifted from the point I want to make is, whether you're a journalist, a medical doctor, a scholar, uh, such as myself, I mean, I guess a plumber. I mean, you've got to get the facts clear, verify them, and then see what your options are. Okay, that's a good jumping off point. Thanks for joining us, Stephen, and thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. And we'll continue these series of discussions with Stephen in the future. If you have questions or comments you want us to raise with Stephen, please send them in. Thanks for joining us on The Real News.